<laughs> hey, let me pray. And as I mentioned, I'm going to be speaking on God's mercy this morning. Father, we just thank you for this incredible family and an hour in this service. And we have not even got to this, the sermon yet, Lord. We thank you for the worship. We thank you for the family time. We thank you for the testimonials of all that you are doing. We thank you that you're a good God. And as we have mentioned prayer requests, we don't say these prayers as a wish. We bring these to the creator of the universe, God Almighty, who is fully able and fully capable to meet all of our needs and to see the power of God flow in and through our lives. So now as we position our hearts and our, our ears and our minds to be open to receive the word of God, Holy Spirit, I pray that you would bring revelation to every person on an individual level here this morning. We thank you. We bless you. Go before us now in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Several years ago, I was peer pressured into going on a sailboat ride. Y'all know me. I'm indoorsy. I like to do things that have this beautiful invention called air conditioning. I don't know why anybody would want to be outside when there's a perfectly good inside to have fun in, but that's, that's just my opinion. But I got peer pressured by a group of pastors to go on this boat ride and it's not something I dream about. As a little boy, I was never into sailboats, and it's always been a dream of mine, not at all. So we went on this trip about seven miles off the coast of uh, Southern California, and, and the captain, who was a member of our church, uh, showed us all the ins and outs of the sailboat. And it's pretty complicated, you know, how to catch the wind, all the ropes, all the pulleys, and uh, how to steer, all the technical aspects of the sailboat, and yada, yada. And then he got to this point where he said, and I'm going to give everybody here on board an opportunity to steer the boat. And in my head, I said, you're going to give them an opportunity to steer the boat because you just told us about the importance of catching and keeping the wind. If you lose the wind, the boat stops and you're stranded and I'm outdoors. I want to go home. OK, I'm not going to make that mistake. And, and so here comes peer pressure. I should have preached on peer pressure this morning because apparently it still continues after high school. And so I got peer pressured in and, and the way they did it was the captain said, Rudy, it's simple. You see those two little ribbons flying in the wind in the front of the boat there? I go, yeah. If the bottom one drops, then you just have to turn a little bit this way. If the top one drops, turn a little bit that way. I said, well, I can handle that. And you know, I'm grateful that there were no other boats because I probably would have crashed into something because all I was doing was focusing on those ribbons the whole time, trying not to lose the wind. Now, why am I bringing up sailing in, in church? It's because I'm a preacher and God will speak to me on anything. And so I see this and I'm immediately, immediately thinking, wow, this is such a lesson on faith because I'm trying to keep the wind. John 3 and several other places reference wind to the Holy Spirit. So I want to keep the power of the Spirit in my life. And the way I do that is with a focus. And I saw that those two ribbons, they can really represent the face of the Father. And our job and the greatest privilege we have on planet Earth is to keep our focus on the face, the presence of God. And so I was taught a lesson there on keeping my focus. And then as the Lord brought this story back to my mind, I thought, well, how do we keep that focus? And that focus, I believe, is maintained by the power and the beauty of the mercy of God. And so today I want to talk to you on the topic of God's mercy. And it's really interesting that the last two sermons I've preached to you have been birthed from a word that God gave to me in our prayer service. Normally I spend time in, in the presence of God and come up with a about five-minute devotional before I launch us into our hour of just being before God to bless him. And every time he speaks that word to my heart at the prayer service, it sticks to my soul and I can't get away from it. So all I've been thinking about all week long is mercy, 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 mercy. And it's amazing. It's kind of like a new car. When you get yourself a new or used car, you don't realize how many of your cars are on the road until you get it. You know, you've never seen a Kia Soul before, but now you have a Kia Soul and you see them everywhere. That's how I felt about the mercy of God this week. I, I didn't realize how many times I actually say the word mercy. I say it all the time and didn't even realize it. I'm actually pretty excited about that because I was preaching and praising God this whole time without even <laughs> recognizing it. But mercy, there, there's a lot of definitions about mercy. 
And most preachers will always use an example of getting pulled over by a police officer and being given a warning and using that as an example of God's mercy, which is true. Because as we know, mercy is where God withholds what you deserve. He doesn't give you what you actually deserve. We deserve death. We deserve hell. We deserve separation. But because of Jesus' grace, now we actually get what we don't deserve, which is forgiveness and life and healing and joy and all things in the Holy Ghost. So I like to use this example as well. When you get pulled over from a cop and he says, I just like you for some reason, I'm going to let you off with the warning. That's mercy because he did not give you what you deserve. You were speeding. You deserved a speeding ticket. But grace is when the officer says, no, I really like you. Here's a gift card to your favorite restaurant. That, that's, that's grace. That's God's grace. That's what he did for us in Christ Jesus. I heard one preacher say this past week that mercy is God's undeserved loving kindness and compassion. His undeserved loving kindness and compassion. So this week I, I dove into the scriptures looking everywhere in the Bible for the word mercy. And I actually got a little frustrated because every time I remembered a scripture about the mercy of God and I went to it in the Bible, it didn't use the word mercy. Most times when the KJV or other translations say mercy, the Hebrew word or the Greek word is actually loving kindness or compassion or strength. So many other words to try to illustrate what mercy is. So I, I found myself being a little frustrated in my search, but it's amazing because God doesn't give us what we deserve. But when I found out about God's loving kindness and compassion, I'm like, he's not just withholding something. He's doing it because he loves us. He, he's not just, I'm God and, and I'm sending the son to die for the sins of the world. And therefore, this is logic. You get mercy. No, he gives mercy because he loves us. He gives mercy because he's compassionate, because he's kind. It's a beautiful thing. And Titus uh, chapter three, verse four to seven. I don't, I don't have a main scripture I'm gonna park on this morning. I I'm just gonna be all over in the scriptures today. So you can just follow along with me on the screen. But Titus chapter three, it says, but when the kindness of God, our savior, and his love for mankind appeared, he saved us not on the basis of deeds, which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out upon us richly through Christ Jesus, our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we would be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. And I've just been, honestly, this past week, wrecked by the mercy of God. I've been overwhelmed and overwhelmed with God's Mercy, and one thing that I discovered about God's mercy, because there's, there's a whole lot about the Lord being so gracious and compassionate to us. But one thing I discovered is that mercy is actually the thing that will birth freedom. When I think of mercy, I automatically think about our freedom. It gives us the freedom to be able to focus on what's most important, that's the presence of God. Now, just speaking personally as a pastor, I got a lot of pressure. Every single Sunday, I need to bring a word of God that will equip you, help transform your life, bring great revelation. I got to be funny, all those things. And, you know, last I checked, Sunday comes in Texas about every seven days. So by the time I'm done preaching, I'm already starting for the next. It just goes on and on. And, you know, I, I help navigate your life issues with you and counseling. You know, I, I have to think of of. Uh, strategies and outreach and how to evangelize the lost. And, and there's just all this pressure. But then I think of pressure that's upon me that's unnecessary because it's not my job. This is God's church. So when I think of mercy, I think, okay, God is the one who's going to speak to me for a message to the congregation. God is going to be the one that enlightens us on how we can reach our community. God is the one who's going to meet us here with his presence and move in the power of the Holy Spirit. God's doing it. So what do I need to do? Shut up. <laughs> Stop worrying. And in the mercy of God, say, where are you going? What are you saying? What are you doing? And I partner with God in what he's already doing rather than think, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? What am I going to do? Mercy brings freedom to relax and to focus on what's most important, the presence of God. 
I learn how to rest in God's mercy and know that I can join him instead of trying to come up with something on my own. Psalm 23, which we all should know by memory, in verse six, it says, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. So it's my encouragement to you, if if you're not seeing God's mercy in your life, it's closer than you think. Sometimes you may be going this direction and mercy is following you, so just turn around. You'll bump right into God's mercy if you want to, and if you're looking. Psalm 46, verse 10, in most translations say, be still and know that I am God. That's a lot harder than they make it seem because uh, for me to sit still is quite the challenge. But I love how the New American Standard says it. It doesn't say be still. It says cease striving and know that I'm God. Because how many know you can be on your couch and your brain could be going a mile a minute and you're stressing and mulling over and really meditating on your worry instead of resting in the mercy of God. Mercy is the key for be, being able to be still and to know that he is God. Many parents in here and many new parents, because we're just having babies like crazy at Southgate apparently, but many babies, or babies, many parents, when their babies get to the kid's age, they have what's called a chore chart. I don't know if you've ever done this. I, I believe we did. I don't know. Nikki did all the work. I was just there to cook and keep people alive. Uh, she did all the important stuff. So we, we did a chore chart, I believe. And basically every time our kid would do something good in a, in a chore, we would put a little gold star. And every one of those gold stars would equal like a quarter. So by the end of the week, depending on how much he did is how much he earned. And that's, you know, cool. However you guys want to parent, it's, it's wonderful. But the problem is these kids grow up as adults and they take that same chore chart analogy and use it with God. That the more things I do for you equals how much I will get from you. And that the blessing I receive from God and the love that I receive from God is based upon what I do. That's why when Andrew's up here singing, merit not my own, it rings so powerfully true. It's not what we can do. It's not about our performance. It's not about our good behavior. It's not about our accomplishments. It's only the work and the love of God. So mercy, we can rest in what he has done and what he has already promised. We have to know that God's mercy is not just an Old Testament thing. I don't know why we equate that the Old Testament is where God gave mercy because he didn't just draw down fire on everybody and their sin. And that grace is after Jesus in the New Testament. No, you and I need mercy today as much as Adam and Eve did at the beginning of time. We need to walk in God's mercy. And so I want to encourage you this morning, a couple things here on the power of God's mercy. If you're taking notes, please fill in number one. We need the mercy of God every day. We need the mercy of God every day. And this is probably one of the most famous Uh, scriptures on the mercy of God in Lamentations chapter 3, verse 22 and 23. And again, the King James says mercy, but in the New American Standard, it translates it with with the other words. So the Lord's loving kindness indeed never, no, loving kindness is. Isn't that cool? It's plural. God is not just loving kindness, it's loving kindness is. There's multiple and they never cease for his compassions or his mercies never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. So last Tuesday, I shared this scripture on the mercy of God, and it just dawned on me in that moment. And this is my holy hypothesis. This is the Rudy International Version, so take it with a grain of salt. But I thought if it says that God's mercies are new every morning and God is creator, does that mean that he's given me a brand new, never before seen mercy each and every day? But just like we, we sang holy and how the angels cry holy all, all day long, 24 seven. I know that when the angels bow down before God in heaven, they come back up and open their eyes and they have a brand new reason to shout out, oh, you're holy. All day long for all eternity, they're seeing something new in the father and it forces them to cry out holy. So I wonder in this side of eternity, walking in this life with all the things that we experience, if God has given us a brand new, never before seen mercy just for that day. He's creator. 
He's without limit. He's eternal. But again, just my opinion. Yesterday I was at, no, yesterday, Friday I was at the uh, Kia, Kia dealership. Sorry, I'm really tired this morning, if you can't tell. It's partly because I stayed up late watching the Cowboys game last night. It's also, <laughs> it's also partly that uh, the devil likes to make your bed way more comfortable in the morning than at night. Why do we struggle so hard to go to bed at night, but it takes everything to get out of bed? I stood up today, I'm like, oh, Jesus, why did you have to resurrect on a Sunday morning? Why not a 3 p.m., you know, just let us sleep in. Sorry, I digress. Anyways, <laughs> I'm glad there were other tired people in the room today. Oh, Jesus, help me. Spirit of tiredness, go. Anyways, I was at the Kia dealership yesterday, and uh, there was a family that walked in, uh, a dad with a very bright pink shirt, and he was just total dad, and then uh, a mom, and then a little girl, probably around three years old. Cutest little thing. And I'm the, the only one else there in the lobby, in this big old lobby at the, at the dealership waiting for my car to be serviced. And what do you think happens when a three-year-old with nothing to do in a place that has nothing, they're going to look for adventures. So she's screaming and laughing and running and touching the cars in the, in the showroom. And she's asking a thousand questions about everything and going up to people, hi, I'm like, hi, as I'm working on my sermon, right? And she's just going around, cutest little thing. And the dad got so upset. And he can say, I forgot what her name was, but get over here, sit down, be quiet, sit down, be quiet. In the back of my head, I'm like, brother, let her live. God hasn't told me to shut up and sit down a thousand times every day too. But what else is she going to do here? Just let her live. And, and the reason it didn't bother me is because every time the father said, get over here, sit down, be quiet, she did. Even though it was a thousand times, she did it every time as she was commanded. What I have a problem with, one of my biggest pet peeves in life is when I'm at a restaurant and there's out of control kids. I mean, screaming like banshees and, and the parents don't do anything about it. I don't know if I, if I want to hit the parent or, you know, adopt the kid to raise them right. I don't know. But it drives me crazy. And the worst thing, oh, mercy. See, I say it a lot. Mercy. <laughs> is when the children say no to the face of the parents. You know I wear flip-flops when I'm not in, uh, in church. And I'll wear flip-flops at a restaurant. And I hear that, I just immediately grab my shoe and no, don't hit the kid, don't hit the kid. Because I know growing up, my mom was here, I know growing up, if I dare to say no to my mom or my dad, I'd have a chancla in the back of my head before the word could come out. It's just, no, Jesus, no, don't say no to your parents. Don't say no to your parents. Child of God, don't say no to your heavenly father. The fastest way to get rid of mercy in your life is to say no to the face of God. Now, we would agree with that and say, of course, never say no to God. We do it every day. We do it every day in sin. We do it every day when, when God asks us to do something and we're too afraid. We say no to him all the time. And what we're doing is forfeiting the mercy that God's already given to us. God's mercy allows us to just trust him and to join him and to say yes to him, and we need it every single day. Again, the beauty of God's mercy is that he's doing all the work. All we have to do is join him. What are you saying? Where are you going? What are you doing, God? And how can I bless you? Most times, Christians are like, God, I want to do this. Can you bless it? Honey child, that's not how it works. It's not bless me, God, so that I can do what I want to do. It's God, what are you doing so I can bless you? And it's his mercy that gives us the power to do that. And Hebrews 4, 15 and 16 says, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. God's mercy is freedom. We need it every day to come boldly before the throne of grace so that we can follow his will. Number two, the house of God must be a place of mercy. The house of God must be a place of mercy. In Exodus 
chapter 25, verse 19, we're giving the description of how to build God's house, the tabernacle, which was a mobile temple, so to say. And look at what it says here in verse 19. Make one cherub on one end and one cherub on the other end, and you shall make cherubim of one piece with the mercy seat at its two ends. The cherubim shall have their wings spread upward, covering the mercy seat with their wings and facing one another. The faces of the cherubim are to be turned toward the mercy seat. You shall put the mercy seat on top of the ark, and in the ark you shall put the testimony of which I have given to you. Again, the tabernacle was this mobile temple that wherever God led, the people of Israel in the wilderness can follow and have the manifest presence of God. Uh, and in, in this description, and all the furniture that has been put about in the tabernacle and all the furniture, we see that in the very center in this box, so to say, and I actually have a picture here if we want to put that on the screen. This box, which is known as the Ark of the Covenant, it's a gold box with very specific instructions on how to transport it. Because if you touch this with sin on, you would die, which is crazy. But inside there, there was the tablets of the Ten Commandments. There was the rod of Aaron who it budded, even though it was cut off. And then a jar of manna that never molded, never went bad. And then on this, which was the actual physical manifest presence of God. This was inside the holies of holies in their tabernacle. Here in the very center of what it's all about, the presence of God, the place where the high priest would atone for the sins of all the people for the year, the place that if you walked into with sin on, you would die because the presence of God was so powerful. That place, that, that ark had what was known as the mercy seat that in the very center of God's will, in the very center of his presence, there has to be mercy. So how, we, how dare we, Southgate Fellowship, create a house for the Lord without mercy? We're not here to judge. We're not here to offend. We're not, we're not here to criticize. We are here to give away this incredible love that God has given to us. Number three, we must be mercy givers. We must be mercy givers. So God's house must be a place of mercy, but we can't come to God's house and experience his mercy and then not give it away. We have to be mercy givers. And I'll read one final scripture to us today that shows the heart of God and what he wants our hearts to be like. In Luke chapter six, verse 32, it says, if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. If you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. If you lend to those uh, from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners in order to receive back the same amount. But love your enemies and do good and lend expecting nothing in return. And your reward will be great and you will be the sons of the most high for he himself is kind to the ungrateful and evil men. And here it is in verse 36. Be merciful just as your father is merciful. So be holy because God is holy. Be perfect because God is perfect. Give mercy because God gave you mercy. We need to be mercy givers. I heard the story of a, of a preacher who had a little daughter who had an extremely generous heart. She would take money out of her mom's purse. She would write her own checks to the church and give a generous offering to the church. <laughs> Everywhere that they went to speak, she was always giving, giving, giving. And she just had this heart for, for giving and um, her grandparents gave her $100 on her birthday. And she came up to her dad and said, here, I want this to go into the offering. And the dad who was teaching her about tithing says, no, honey, it's, that's yours. You only have to give God the 10%. Give 10 and keep the rest for yourself. That's your money. Why would you want to do that? I mean, dumbfounded that the kid wanted to, to be generous. And she looks up at her dad and says, well, it's my money, but I can give it all to God because if I need more money, I'll just go to you. <laughs> What if we did that with God and his mercy? What if we were so free to give away everything because we know whatever we need, we can pull from heaven. We have from our father. Imagine if we did the same thing with God. God wants to give to you in order to move through you. God wants to fill you with his mercy so that it can flow like a river, not like a lake in which we hold it down. We can be merciful, but at the same time, we can also be wise. And I say that for a lot of reasons, because 
We, we need to forgive people. We need to have mercy, but we also need to be wise. As an example, if there's a wife who's being very uh, physically abused at home, we're not to extend mercy and to allow the abuse to continue. We want to remove her from that situation and get the problem solved and hopefully reconciliation and anything else that needs to happen there. You don't want to just get, you know, pummeled by people or, or taken advantage of by people. Another example is when I had a campus in Southern California, a uh, church campus, we were four blocks away from the beach. And some of y'all may be thinking, wow, how pretty, how this. No, 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 no. It just meant that's where all the homeless people lived. <laughs> and we blessed homeless people. We had system for homeless people. But one thing about the homeless people is that some of them really want to be homeless. And so what I did is I, I created a system where I got in touch with this company called Interfaith. And what they did is that they provided a hot breakfast and a sack lunch every day for anybody who would want. They had showers available. They had a food pantry. They had a, a place filled with clothes. If you wanted to change, you could shave, you can get dressed up. They had tutors to help you on job applications and on how to conduct a good interview or, you know, being in a good interviewee. They had all, and I even had bus vouchers, free bus vouchers to give to them, say, go to stop 309, it'll drop you right off at the door. And nine times out of 10, they'd be like, oh, no, I've been there before. Uh, those people are horrible. I'm like, oh, really? Because I go there a lot and they're quite nice. You know, I, it's the stories that they tell over and over again. And I just need $20, brother. And, and uh, uh, I just don't have any money this week. And, and I, uh, my electric bill is due. And could you just pay my electric bill? Sure. I would love to pay your electric bill. Give me the bill. I'll pay it. I'll call right now. Well, if you could just give me the money, if you could just get off my porch. <laughs> God bless you. No. So we want to be merciful, but at the same time, we also want to be wise. And I say that because, you know, we, we, we don't want to be taken advantage of and, and we want to be used by God. But we also need the power of the Holy Spirit that we don't need to worry because in the moment he'll give us all that we need to say and to do to bless. So in conclusion, I just challenge you to reflect on God's mercy. What has his mercy done in your life? We should have been dead. We should have been on our way to hell. But somehow, some way, we're sitting in a comfy little chair in church on a Sunday morning. Review and reflect on his mercy. Realize that even though you are saved, you still need God's mercy every single day. <laughs> and let God's mercy be the freedom that you need to fully surrender and to fully trust him. So Father, we thank you for just a glorious day in church. We thank you for your house of worship, your house of praise, your house of prayer, in which we collectively can come as an offering to you and experience your love and be in the midst of your presence. We thank you for our opportunity here today to sing to you and to worship you and to magnify you. And now as we prepare to finish off this day and as we prepare to start a brand new week, it's my hope, it's my prayer for your people, God, to go with mercy. Father, I thank you that you have healed them and filled them with your peace and your power. I thank you that we can go in your joy. And I pray that we would constantly be reminded by the Holy Spirit to worship, worship, worship all through this week. Help us to rest on the powerful, beautiful aspect of your mercy in our lives. Help us to find freedom in slowing down, looking to you, focusing on your face, trusting you so that we can simply follow what you desire for our lives. We thank you for this incredible time. We thank you for the family here. Now as we go, may you protect us. May you fill us with all hope. May you guard us. May you speak to us that where we go, we are an example of your love and your power. We thank you for today. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Well, God bless you, family. There'll be some wonderful people who would love to pray with you up here if you're in need of any more prayer. Otherwise, have a beautiful day.